You know, um, speaking about women, now we'll move a little bit to talking about kids. You know, as kids, we wanted to be many things. An Oxford professor once told me about his nine-year-old daughter wanting to be a conductor. So he asked her, what type of conductor do you want to be? A bus conductor or an orchestra conductor? And she replied innocently, no, Dad, I want to be a conductor for electricity. <laughs> so innocent, right? When I was her age, I wanted to be a love doctor. I would line up my soft toy animals all in a row with Naughty and Mr. Peter Rabbit and Monchichi, and I would make them tell me their love problems, and I would pretend to solve them. And one day, my, my dad came, and he found out about my underground activity, and he said, you must be crazy, Grace. No one would ever employ a love doctor. And I turned to Naughty, and I said, how bizarre. If love and happiness are you know, every human being's two main goals, then surely there will be many jobs for love doctors. I mean, there are doctors for everything else, for food, for car, for dogs. So why are there no, no um, love doctors in the world? So I thought, well, if the world would not hire me, then perhaps God would. So I wanted to be a nun. <laughs> and um, in all my excitement, I ran towards my dad, and I'm like, Dad, I want to be a nun. And he looked at me, and he said, Grace, God would rather have none than to have a nun like you. <laughs> and it was because I was all mischievous and all that. But um, my dad belonged to that generation of parents where they think that careers um, is a way to make a living and not a way to self-actualize. And so what has love and happiness got to do with world change? I think world change is brought about by happy, satisfied people who have lived fulfilled lives. There is no way that a bitter, insecure, unfulfilled person would think about changing the world, right? Because, first of all, they've got themselves to fend for. So the world is very much shaped by individuals who have achieved or attained a certain level of self-understanding, self-assurance, and self-actualization. Because service, service doesn't start when you have something to give. It starts when you have nothing left to take. To some, it is by being rich. Billionaires like Bill Gates and Jeff Skoll, the first president of eBay, have felt that they have had enough and are now dedicating their lives, or maybe a year of their lives, to become um, full-time social entrepreneurs taking care of causes they care about. To others, fulfillment means living by their passion every day of their lives. You have factors for justice like Nelson Mandela or factors for the poor like Mother Teresa. This is what I call World Change 1.0 where world change is brought about by heroes, people who are either rich or brave. But to be honest, how many of us will be the next Bill Gates or the next Mother Teresa's of the world? Not many, right? So how then do we, as ordinary people, think about world change? So this is my hypothesis. My hypothesis is that a fulfilled life, a sense of life fulfillment can be created. The feeling of feeling like a billionaire, even though you're not <laughs> near to being one, can be engineered. Um, I mean, there are, there are many ways of um, getting there, but I will share some of the ways that have helped me. First of all, spend money on experiences, not products. Not that products are not great, it's just that we get bored of them pretty quickly, right? Like from a fast car to a faster car, from an LV bag to a Prada bag. You know, my close girlfriend who is a banker tells me that in a bank, women check out, check out their brand labels all the time. There is almost an unspoken, agreed upon ranking system of people based on brands. Hermes is now topping the charts. So it's never ending, right? Experiences, on the other hand, will leave indelible marks on our lives. You know, traveling around the world, meeting new people of different cultures, spending time with your loved ones, taking care of friends and animals and things like that. These experiences will create um, a f the sense of life fulfillment faster than products do. Another thing that helps me greatly is to conscientiously observe and design your life. Can I have a show of hands? How many of you have created Excel spreadsheets? Show of hands. Oh my god, <laughs> that's a lot. Am I in the correct event or what? <laughs> so we do that to analyze the important things in our lives. 
like profit and loss, so, um, cash inflow and outflow. But how many of us have sketched our lives on paper? Isn't that important too? So when I started um, doing that, you know, I sketched how my life on paper, the entire journey and how the dots connect. I am amazed by how the dots really do connect. And I'll weigh the best case scenario and the worst case scenario so that I have a sense of where I'm heading to. And this has helped me a lot. And perhaps if you, if you go back and try tonight, you'll also be amazed by how the dots really do connect, if you're true to yourself. Um, all these are helpful um, ways of achieving self-fulfillment. But nothing beats the fulfillment that you will feel when you have found your role in the world. It is not so much of what you can give to the world. It is more of what the world needs from you. So if you treat the world as a person and ask, what do you need from me? The gap between the me now and the me having satisfied that role in the world is your gap of self-actualization. And there's a process to get there. Um, we'll do it step by step because we have learned from the men, to, men in our lives that we can't multitask, right? So <laughs> the first step is really to know your passion, to know your natural gift. And it is not just something that you love doing, but it's also something that you are great at doing. You can compare this between your peers. And secondly, to use your passion. And the final gratification will come when society recognizes your value by the passion you live by. The overlap of these three circles will create a very happy, self-fulfilled, and satisfied you. And the sooner you find your role in the world by following these steps, um, the happier you will be quicker and the more hope the world has. So the good news is that this is already happening rapidly and dramatically. The gen generation Y, people who are born in between 1980s to the 2000s are now called the new hippies because they are now, um, thanks to budget airlines and free unlimited access to information, they travel and they understand the world better than any previous generation could. And World Change 2.0, um, are people like this, right? Louis is a friend and he's from Montreal, but he has lived in Africa with Engineers Without Borders Canada for 10 years. Lara is a medical doctor from Stanford. He has traveled more than, to more than 100 countries and has set up an orphanage in Kenya. And we went to Oxford to study social entrepreneurship together. Um, world Change 2.0 is where world change is the power of many, not power of a few. It's for some reason, and by how the society has evolved and how success has been defined. This is what's happening today. You know, under the feudal system, power was success. In capitalism, success is money. But with the backlash on capitalism and all that's going on around the world, it, people are hungry and are looking for alternate systems and alternate ways to govern behavior and to define success. And in, in many ways, the pressures of, of the we as society is giving way for the idealisms of me to surface. When I was 24, I became a social entrepreneur. But this age is coming lower and lower um, in terms of self-fulfillment. I met a guy from Cornell a couple of months ago, and he's creating a platform to democratize um, equity investing in social enterprises. When I was 20, I had no idea what each of that word meant, but he's 20. And just last month, I was in Beijing facilitating um, youth entrepreneurs from Europe and China. And they were asking big questions, you know, apart from running million dollar businesses, big questions such as, what does success really mean to me? Why am I growing my business? What is growth? What does this mean for my employees? They were all mostly below 27. So we have hope, right? And also in World Change 2.0, Success is being redefined in every level. At the global level, markets and industries are giving space for new fields to flourish. A case in point would be social entrepreneurship. When I was 24, I had a dream of bringing education to children in remote villages in Indonesia. I woke up feeling very excited because firstly, I realized that I had the exact same dream eight years before. So two dreams, 
um, is enough to like throw me way out of the corporate world, right? But I also felt equally unqualified. I had a business degree, not a social science degree. How on earth will I bring education to children in remote villages? So when Pamela Hartigan, a pioneer in this field, defined a social entrepreneur as a combination of Richard Branson and Mother Teresa, crazily ambitious in the head, but kind and pure in the heart, it gelled. It stuck with me, with me and also many others who are like me, who fall in between the labels of um, traditional names. So the social entrepreneurship field has, has taken its course. Right now, it's a huge movement all over the world. Universities like Harvard, Stanford, and Oxford are embedding social entrepreneurship into their MBA programs and into their core education system. Governments like the Obama administration and the UK's Office of the Third Sector are setting up office for social innovation with huge budgets just to define new policies and legal infrastructures for such enterprises. Two Nobel Prize um, has been given to social entrepreneurs. Paul Hawking calls this the biggest movement in the world that's happening right now. So how do we go about this? Social entrepreneurship is just an example of how um, new markets are being formed through mergers and through hybrids. It's just a glimpse of what is more to come. We need new uh, hybrid fields. We need new names and labels to be created. The importance of language is so important at this point because the language that we are using today belongs to yesterday. You know, there's this bizarre situation that is going on where the conversation is around fair trade and trade, clean tech and tech, social enterprises and enterprises. What does this really mean? Does it mean that normal trade and normal tech have the legitimacy to be unfair and unclean? Or does it mean that clean tech and fair trade have the rights to be more morally upright? I really look forward to the day where the distinctions of these things um, are vanished because every, fair should, every trade should be fair. You know, every technology should be clean. Every enterprise should take care of its society and its environment, and every profit must be motivated by purpose. I also look forward to the day where love doctors is a legitimate profession, just like how social entrepreneurship has been. In many ways, I am around a community of um, love doctors already, and we want to bring happiness to the otherwise um, oversight, overlooked communities, the poor, the marginalized environment. And it, is, it has been a humbling um, experience. I remember the first library that we set up four years ago, we, we went to a village eight hours away from any town in Sumatra with a truck filled with a thousand books. And also, I wanted the team to use the library to teach happiness to the poor. Because to me, th that is the only metric in life that the poor can outbid the rich. They can be happier than the rich, even though they have less. But what I found out across the years is that the rich has got a lot to learn about happiness from the poor. And so for those of you who really want to do good for the world and change the world for real, um, you don't have to be afraid anymore because there is now a community. That's Pamela Hartigan. And this community, I promise you, we will get you and we will support you, right? And for my dad, um, he's pretty glad that I have found my own community of a little bit crazy people because it is there that I feel normal. And perhaps a little, pr a little crazy should be the new norm. So you really don't have to be brave um, to change the world anymore because it is now World Change 2.0 and you don't really need to be a hero. Um, I, but you have to be brave enough to want to be happy and you have to be brave enough to recognize your role in the world because it is by living by your dream that the worst case scenario is always better than the best case scenario when you don't. Like Howard Thurman said, do not ask what the world needs. Ask what makes you come alive and go do that because what the world needs is for people to come alive. So I wish us all the courage to come alive because now the world is ready for that. Thank you.